Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you whenever and wherever you are watching our worship gathering. This is a worship gathering for First Christian Church in Sullivan, Illinois for the last Sunday of January 2021. My name is Pastor Grant and I want to thank you for joining us for this uh, worship experience. I hope that it is meaningful to you and that you are uplifted as you participate today. A couple of announcements to share with you before we begin our time of worship. Uh, looking at the week to come in the life of First Christian Church, we have First Tuesday Lunch that takes place on the first Tuesday, hence the clever name. That will be uh, in Fellowship Hall again this month, so it is a bring your own lunch event. You are welcome to park in the back parking lot and join us at 11.30 for a time of food and fellowship. Uh, Ladies of Faith has in fact moved back, moved their meeting back to 5 West uh, Coffee Lounge. So uh, that's Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. All leaders are welcome to join. They uh, share a lot of fellowships, share some great devotional content, and it's a great weekly meeting. That's uh, most of what we have going on in the life of the church in terms of events this week. Uh, So as we begin our time of worship now, I would invite you to join me in prayer. God, open our hearts and spirits today to hear the great good news of your power and presence with all your people. Fill our hearts with rejoicing as the words are proclaimed through both song and story. Enliven us and remind us that you are with us through all of our lives. Thank you for the love that is shown to us through your son, Jesus. Thank you for your presence among us now through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are welcome now to follow along with our call to worship. And then following that, we have a song of praise. The 
wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me We come now to an extended time of prayer, an opportunity for us to be in communication with one another, to share our joys, things that we experience throughout our week, that we, where we see God at work, God doing the work through God's people, and we share our concerns, things perhaps in our own families or our own lives, things within our church family and within our community and certainly far beyond. So we welcome you to share your prayer requests via email to grant at FCCSullivan.org. If you are watching live currently on Facebook, you are welcome to share your requests in the, in the comments below. And those joining with you will be in prayer. And I will uh, look for those later on today and find those and add them to our list that we send out each week. I would invite you now, if you would like to share a name or two, a situation or two, share it aloud to God now as we go to God in prayer. God of all creation, you are the one who knows us best. You are the one who created us, the one who sustains us. God, your love for us, we proclaim it here and now. We know that you are a God who is near in our time of need. God, we thank you that you hear us when we cry out to you. We thank you for your faithfulness, which is evident in your word. God, as we share names and situations now, people who are important to us, we ask that you would surround them with your love now. May your Holy Spirit give them a sense of your presence with them, caring for them. God, continue to inspire and encourage us to be a source of light, of love, of hope, a reminder for people who are hurting that there is hope. We thank you, we praise you always for your son Jesus, for the promise that you give to us through his death, burial, and resurrection. We have hope. In his name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew. If you have a Bible nearby and would like to open that up to be able to follow along during the message, open up to Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to read to you uh, this parable and then during the message we will focus on a similar parable as well. So looking specifically at verses 31 and 32, and I like to read from the New Living Translation. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. May God add blessings to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this word today. One of the best ways that we learn is from hearing stories. It's how our brains are wired. In fact, one of the best ways to get someone's attention is with the simple phrase, let me tell you a story. Jesus was 
a master storyteller. His parables were these earthly stories with spiritual meanings, and Jesus' parables have withstood the test of time because they, they speak to our timeless human situations, our struggles, our questions, and our fears. Our technologies have changed quite radically since Jesus' time, but, but the stuff that we wonder about and the stuff that we struggle with hasn't changed that much at all. Jesus almost always taught using stories. And one of the coolest things about his stories is that he didn't, he didn't wrap things up all nice and tidy. He rarely spelled out the meaning of the stories that he told. It's different than most sermons or messages like this or like today. So that means that his stories demand something from the listener. They demand that we participate in the story. Stories help us to make sense of things we don't know. They help us to have a sense of being a part of something bigger. They, they spark emotions. They invite us into a new understanding of the way that the world works around us. Stories have the ability to change our perspective, to, to change our world. You see, in, in just three years with 12 followers traversing about 10 square mile area, Jesus, one of the greatest storytellers on earth, captivated crowds and answered questions with his stories. So in this series that we're starting today, we're exploring the stories of Jesus, the parables that literally turned ideas about life, love, and faith upside down, and that continue to change our world, even today. So I've been researching the power of stories, and I came across an article that summarizes the best or, or the most powerful Super Bowl commercials over the last 50 years or so, and I was surprised by the article's result. The article said the most powerful commercial, well, you might remember the, this commercial, it happened uh, back in 2014. Maybe you have a guess as to which commercial it might have been. They're often funny ones, but sometimes there's meaningful commercials. I asked the question on social media this week and received several good replies. A few of them, in fact, recalled this Commercial. I have this commercial that I want to show you, to share with you, so take a look. Well, you only need the light when it's burning low. Only miss the sun when it starts to snow. Only know you love her when you let her go. Only know you've been high when you're feeling low Only hate the road when you're missing home Only know you love her when you let her go And you let her go This is the most powerful commercial from any Super Bowl of all time. And it's, it's just a 60-second video, but you, you can't help but get involved and invested in those furry animals. You see, there's this emotional experience where we're invited into a bigger story that, that tugs at our heart, right? Maybe it changes our perspective a little bit. You have no idea what the commercial is really about or what it's for, except for that very last image, right? That tells you, oh, <laughs> it's a beer commercial of all things, of course. But, but I think what this says about the power of stories is that we don't sell products, we tell stories. Because stories invite people into an experience that is bigger than anything they can imagine. And this is where there is great power. Because stories convey great power, they allow us to, to communicate in ways that other things simply can't. Now, there's a, a growing amount of 
research about the power of storytelling. Because these coming generations, Generation Y, Generation Z, they're, they're more prone to pursue experiences than they are products. They are more prone to shell out all that they have and all that they are to have an experience, to engage in something instead of possessing or, or holding on to something. Isn't that interesting? So as we seek to be people who can reach younger generations, we need to, to invite them to experience God with us. We need to figure out how exactly we do this, but it's good news because the heart of our faith rests in a man who with such a small amount of time told story after story, stories that would change the world. Jesus was really the best storyteller of all, and he did so in a really, really small and compact fashion. He was really to the point with his stories. Mark has this to say about Jesus. He says, Jesus used many similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as much as they could understand. In fact, in his public ministry, Mark says, he never taught without using parables. But afterward, when he was alone with his disciples, he explained them in detail. Could you imagine hearing the explanation of Jesus' stories? You see, Jesus' leadership style, it was simple. His communication strategy was clear. When Jesus spoke, he spoke often using parables and stories. And so if you look at the Gospels, if you look at Jesus' life, you, you see that he told an average of 40 stories. And 35% of everything he said in the Gospels were stories. Like, for example, if you look at Luke's Gospel, you see that that number goes up even to 52%. In Matthew's Gospel, 43% of everything that Jesus said were contained in stories. It's, it's really pretty incredible. And what's even more than that is that the parables that Jesus told, they're considered by scholars to be the, the most accurate words that we have in Scripture attested to Jesus. This means that if you had a red letter Bible, these would be like the, the reddest letters in your Bible. This has led scholars to say that if you want to meet Jesus, to know the real Jesus, read his parables. And that's what we're going to do these next few weeks. Now, interpreting these parables presents us with a bit of a challenge, right? Mark says that, that Jesus explained these things, uh, these parables, to his disciples in private. And I just wish that we had some of those private explanations. Because some of these parables... They're, they're kind of tricky. But of all the parables that we hear, there are o only a select few that we ever really get to see unpacked, right, based on those private experiences, which means that it is our task then to unpack these other stories that changed the world, to try to do our best to understand what it is Jesus was saying. And so what I found is that often when we read parables, we don't really scratch too far beneath the surface. Right? We kind of like to reduce their interpretation down to one really pithy, moralistic teaching point. But when we hover only at the surface, we miss the depth and the, the power of the greatness of the stories that Jesus tells. You see, Jesus' parables were not just these simple stories, really. They, they were complex in so many ways. They were these stories that were forcing us to understand new revelation about who we are, and about how it is that we live, and about how we view the world around us. So these parables, they should surprise us, they should challenge us, they should shock us. And in some cases, I think they should probably offend us just a little bit. Scholars say that our first re reaction to a parable should be to, to step back in shock from what we have just heard. But what I've found is that we often like to, we like to draw nearer to parables, right? Because of how nice and neat and tidy they feel how good they make us, they make us feel inside. But when we do that, we really, we miss the point. One, one scholar said, said it this way, said, nobody would crucify a teacher who told pleasant stories that enforce prudent morality. You see, they crucified Jesus because these stories, they were countercultural. These stories turned the world upside down. So there is a depth to these stories that we need to experience in order that, that we might really grasp the kingdom of heaven. So 
enough talking about parables. How about we just dive in? We begin with a parable that feels fairly familiar, I hope, uh, in the parable from our scripture reading this morning. It, it's a sh short parable, so let me share it again. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. Again, that's from Matthew's gospel. So this parable is familiar because it gives us this, this great picture of contrast, right? Something so tiny, something imperceptible, this smallest of seeds, it grows and becomes a tree. It flourishes so that even birds take comfort in its branches. So what we get in this story is that the, the small, the, the inconsequential, the imperceptible little thing has the power, by God's grace, to be this, this world-changing entity. So this becomes an inspiring story, right? This is inspiring. It, it, it's motivational. It's a story that, that we need to hear. So, so that the insignificant part of us, so that each and every one of us as individuals can believe with faith that, that we do have power. We have power to change the world, even as small or as insignificant as we might feel or our, as our actions might be. You see, this really is a powerful parable. It's a parable that we need to motivate us, to inspire us, to take action. But that's not all it tells us. If, if we stop there, we have something that's pretty nice, pretty tidy, right? It draws all of us together. We can, we can put that on a motivational poster on the wall. But I think that's really to miss the point and the depth of what Jesus is trying to communicate in this story. This was actually a very controversial parable. This was a controversial story for anybody with ears to hear. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like the smallest of seeds. Well, that was totally opposite of what everybody else had in mind when they thought about the kingdom of heaven. Right? That is not what they would have imagined. When, when people thought about the kingdom, when they thought about the reign of God, they weren't thinking about small. They weren't thinking about something imperceptible, something little like a seed. They were thinking about these, these giant trees, right? You hear about some of these in scripture, Daniel, Ezekiel, the psalmist. They had these pictures of these trees, these noble cedars of Lebanon, we read. The, the, the mighty oak that stood so tall that even the ends of the earth would see its glory. Now that sounds like the kingdom of heaven. You see, when they thought about the kingdom, they thought about something, something huge, something that was, that was strong. They thought about something that, that was powerful. And Jesus says to everybody, everybody with ears to hear, that the kingdom of heaven, no, it, it's not any of those things. It's, it's this, this small, it's the smallest of seeds. This, this tiny, imperceptible thing Though, though you might expect, yes, a big, strong tree, though you might long for a mighty king who comes to rule and to reign with a sword, overturning all of the nations, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, no, the kingdom of heaven isn't like that at all. See, it's, instead it's riding in to Jerusalem on the shoulders of a donkey, a king that specializes in meekness and humility, a king who doesn't ride in on a war horse, Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven, it, it, it's like him. It's like this, this little thing that has the power to grow in shocking and surprising ways. That's what Jesus says. And he doesn't stop there. He describes the smallest seed in a very specific kind of way. He calls it mustard. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Well, this would have really rung loudly in the ears of everybody who could hear. Because mustard, it wasn't this desired plant, and it wasn't really a tree, it was, it was more like a shrub. And that's probably giving it some grace. It was really nothing much more than a weed in a lot of ways. And weeds, 
But we know weeds have characteristics that, that really aren't sought after, right? Mustard was not advised to be planted in a field of staple crops, okay? Mustard was something that you were taught to avoid. It was something you, you tried to run away from because really it was this invasive species which meant the second somebody planted mustard, it just took over wherever it was planted. It would grow and it would flourish. It would grow like a weed, choking out the life of all the plants nearby. You've probably experienced this before. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's like this despised variety of a plant that will take over everything. In fact, if we carry that metaphor out just a little bit further, it's just like every other little weed. It, it grows in a way that you can't kill it, bury it, or get it out of your garden because it just keeps coming back. Even, even when you think you have won the day over some mustard, it comes back. It rises from the grave. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. Now, I don't know what you know about weeds. I've dealt with uh, my fair share of weeds before. You probably have as well. Weeds, if left alone, they just, they take over. They grow and grow and grow. They're invasive. They're a nuisance. Growing up, we had a neighbor who was uh, a nature lover. She did not want her lawn mowed. She doesn't want anything cared for. Didn't want any landscaping done. And so the approach to her house was like a jungle. In fact, she lived down a long lane, a gravel lane, and the weeds down the center of this gravel would grow in such a way that when you drove down the lane, you'd just hear them scraping along the underside of your vehicle. So it was a very weedy situation. Now, as strange as it seems, this, this is where we experience the power of the kingdom of heaven. When, when it is planted, it flourishes, it grows, it consumes everything around it. You can't kill it, you can't fight it back. You can try, but guess what? It comes back once more. Now I'm sure you've planted gardens before. It takes time to kill weeds once they've taken hold. Once they've taken root, you've got to invest a lot of time and energy. So maybe you're starting to see how countercultural this message is. But, but it's not just that, because mustard did not come to, to kill and to destroy and to choke out the life of everything around it. Mustard in Jesus' day and age had, had a very specific purpose. It was a healing agent. They used it in medicine. So even though it was despised when planted next to staple crops, it was, it was well known what it could do in the way of things like healing. You see, mustard was used in a variety of ways. It was used to heal snake and scorpion bites, toothaches, indigestion, asthma, epilepsy, constipation, and that's just the tip of the iceberg as to, to how mustard would be used to heal and as a remedy. Which means that in addition to understanding the, it, its growth potential and, and knowing that you can't kill it, it also came with this, this purpose, this greater purpose of healing. And so do you see what Jesus is doing here with this parable? He's saying that the kingdom of heaven is going to, to come like him. It's going to start out small and imperceptible. But as it gets going, nothing is going to be able to stop it. Nothing will be able to kill it. It will grow extravagantly. For some, this will be desirable. For some, this will be shocking. For most, this will be surprising. And yet, as it continues to grow, its purpose will be unmistakable because it's going to have the capacity to heal the nations, to heal all of creation, truly. So much so that the birds of the air will find comfort in its branches. See, this is not just a simple story. This is a story that is expected to turn our understanding of of God's kingdom, it's going to turn our understanding upside down. And the second story that comes right after this is just like it. Jesus moves on to a, a similar story with some different elements. He says, Jesus also used this illustration. This is Matthew again. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. 
Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. So you put these parables side by side, and you can begin to see that there are some comparisons here. Yeast, just like a seed, is very small and imperceptible. Yeast, just like a seed, brings things to life. Yeast gives rise to dough. The seed gives rise to plants. Well, you also see that these parables have to do with the theme of secrecy, right? The yeast has to be hidden in the dough, and the seed has to be hidden in the dirt. So in order for God's kingdom to take root, somebody needs to act first. That person's action then has the power to change the world. So as insignificant as it seems, it becomes an action of significance. Both of these parables point us to God's potential of working through us. And this is good news. And this is, this is where the parable of the yeast becomes controversial. It's not a parable about yeast. It's a parable about the person using the yeast. In order for the dough to rise, it's going to take someone to act. It's, it's going to take an agent of change. And Jesus doesn't describe a, a holy man in a temple doing this work. He describes a woman in her kitchen. Now that would have rung loudly again in the ears of those who would hear. So this would have been so countercultural, and that's to put it lightly. Truly, it would have been offensive. Everyone would have st stepped back in hearing Jesus' words, comparing the kingdom of heaven to a woman making and baking bread. Yet, this is what Jesus says. He doesn't just describe the kingdom of heaven as something being brought about by a woman. He, he actually describes the amount of dough that she's working with. Three measures of dough. Okay, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, right? For us, this, this doesn't sound like a whole bunch of dough to our modern ears, but early listeners would have known that this was about 40 to 60 pounds worth of flour. I mean, she was preparing something like 60 to 80 loaves of bread. This is way more than anyone would need or could eat on their own. So Jesus here is talking about her ability to, to cultivate this, this extravagant amount of bread, which points us again to God's abundance and points us to Jesus' pattern of ministry and mission. Think of the very first miracle that Jesus performed. We know this. He turns water into wine. How, many, how much wine? 60 gallons of wine? Who can consume that much wine even at a wedding? Well, maybe I shouldn't answer that question. I, I hope none of you could consume that much wine. But it's this abundant kind of picture. It's the same with the fish and the loaves feeding the 5,000. So when you hear, hear three measures of flour, you think of God's abundance and God's extravagance. Jesus uses this amount for a reason. Because he knew for, for those who, who knew the Torah, it would trigger their memory. You see, if you go back to the beginning, you might remember Genesis chapter 18, the story of the beloved couple, married for over 100 years, Abraham and Sarah. They're, they're well into their, their retirement years, and here three strangers begin walking toward their house. It's an interesting experience. They, they see these messengers approaching, and Abraham rises to his feet, and he says to his wife, he says, I need you to go, and I need you to do something for me. Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. You can look that up for yourself. That's Genesis chapter 18, verse 6. So can you imagine this 100-year-old woman, Sarah, kneading 60 pounds of dough? It's almost laughable, right? <laughs> yet, yet knowing Sarah, yet Sarah does it knowing full well that these visitors can't eat that much bread. She does this knowing that it's an insurmountable task, and yet she goes for it. And then she overhears Abraham being told that she is going to bear a child, and Sarah hears this, and what does she do? She starts laughing. Who could blame her, right? So Jesus is saying. The kingdom of heaven 
is like this. Abraham and Sarah give rise to God's covenant because from that point on, what was hidden in Sarah's womb, what was being nurtured and strengthened and flourishing, was going to give rise to the rest of the kingdom for generations to come. Are you seeing the connection here? In the same way that the pinch of yeast gives rise to the dough and cannot remain hidden. The same way that the mustard seed hidden in the soil will give rise to the thing that is going to, to take over the world for the healing of the nations. This is how the kingdom works, says Jesus. It's nothing that you could think to expect. It's surprising, it's shocking, it's extravagant, it's abundant. These stories, they, they force us to remember that what was once hidden will not remain that way forever. Time and time again, Jesus urges us to come out of hiding. He tells us that now is the time, now is the time to reveal the glory of God, to let our light shine like it is never before. We cannot keep it hidden. We must not keep it hidden. So these stories force us to wonder whether we actually believe that something that started as small as one person with 12 friends on a confined piece of property would actually be able to, to change the world forever. Do we actually believe that, that one person, like each and every one of us, actually has the capacity to give rise to the world around us because of the grace that Jesus offers to us? Does your life reveal that belief? Do your actions suggest that you have the power to change the world? My hope is that each of us would believe that and that we would live lives that reveal that belief to the world around us as we seek to have faith as large as a mustard seed, and as we seek to have faith that is powerful as a pinch of yeast. Let's pray. God, thank you for the depth of this story, this parable that Jesus tells us. Thank you for the reminder that it is up to us to act, that we are your change agents, that we can bring about change in our world, true, true lasting meaning, meaningful change. God, help us to let our light shine brighter than ever before in a world that needs it so desperately. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Each week during our time of worship, we spend just a few moments to reflect on what it means to be and to give an offering. God has blessed us in so many ways. When we look at our lives, when we look at all that we have and all that we are, how can we not respond in thanksgiving to what God has done? So we do that in a variety of ways, through how we give our time, through how we treat other people. Of course, we support the work and ministry of of a variety of uh, things, community organizations, and things like First Christian Church. We strive to do great work here for the blessing of all people. And so we thank you for your continued generosity, for your support during this time of pandemic. We thank you for remembering to make your offering each week or each month, however you do it. We are grateful for the support that we have seen and grateful for the love that we are able to continue to show to our people, to people in our community, and to people far beyond. May you always recognize God's blessings in your life and respond to them as he urges you. For us at First Christian Church, communion is a weekly event. Many Christians, many churches handle this differently, but we feel that it is important, it is central to the life of faith that we live, 
to gather, to commune in this way, to remember Christ's sacrifice, to accept God's forgiveness, to be loved, to reflect on our week and to look to the week ahead and how we can be a blessing to others, how we can share God's love and God's light. We remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. We remember that he was buried. We remember that he was resurrected. That is what we celebrate, his death, burial, and resurrection. That is what is significant for us as Christians. So as you take the elements that you have gathered today, whatever they are, they need not be bread and grape juice, may you remember that his body was broken, that his blood was poured out, not just for the forgiveness of our sins, but to give us hope, to defeat death, to make things right. Let us continue in our calling to bring about a more just and kind and loving world, a world that would know the love of God through Jesus. You are welcome to partake of your elements at any point during this next song. Thank you for your continued participation in our online worship experiences. It is a blessing to be able to share these with you and to see everyone who is being blessed by, uh, by these weekly services. So thank you for being here. As we prepare to wrap up our time of worship today, I offer you this blessing. May the love of God the Father, may the grace of Jesus Christ, and may the peace of the Holy Spirit guide you and keep you always. Amen. Thank you.